Hi lovely folk. Let's take a look at whether or not there's a case for creativity. I'm going to argue that, um, yeah, yeah, you're studying ad creative. You kind of want there to be a case for creativity, right? So if we take a look at where advertising all began and how it evolved, we can see where the creative elements came in. So initially, the first ads that people really saw en masse or the ads that reached a lot of people were when newspapers were invented. And if you look back over those, there are a lot of ads for books, there's a lot of ads for quack medicines and all those sorts of things. And they were great because they offset the cost of printing. So that's sort of 16th to 18th century. In the 19th century, the first advertising agencies appeared in the UK and the US. And that was a result of industrialization and mass production. So you had a lot of um, people mass producing similar products, like for example, soap. And they wanted to um, promote their soap to people so people would choose it over the other brands. Kind of makes sense, right? So agencies would then step in and give them advice on how to do that. Then you get to the 20th century where you've got radio, cinema, and television, which made ads more immediate and more personal. That's where we start talking directly to somebody. And now we're in the digital age, where advertising is more of a conversation. It gives consumers the chance to talk back, to say whether they agree or whether they disagree. So this, this is how it all started to flow initially, and that affected the tone of voice in ads throughout then. So if we go back to the 16th to 18th centuries with the invention of newspapers, people took what they read to be gospel. And you possibly know some grandparents or uh, older people who still believe everything they read. The idea being that if you took the time to spend the money to get that message out to everybody, then it must be right. Hopefully you guys all question that. Kind of hoping. So that, that was the, the tone of voice then, very authoritative, okay? It was still authoritative in the 19th century. Ads were very feature-driven, you know, so this brand new automobile has 600 horsepower, which is completely made up, obviously, um, but it was all about the specs of a product or the features of a product, not what the product did for the customer. And the idea was to sound authoritative and to sound incredibly impressive. And then people will think yours is the best. Yeah. 20th century, we got the idea of ads as entertainment. And there was a time in sort of the 1960s, particularly in the United States, where people watched TV more for the ads than they did for the television programs. There was a novelty to it as well. And with that new medium of TV, then people were able to be more creative with how they engaged people um, with their brands and their products. And now today with the digital age, as I say, we question everything, absolutely everything. We have the power to give online reviews. Um, consumers are actually empowered and we as advertisers need to base all our ads on fact and truth. Absolutely, that goes without saying, but we also need to give our audience the power to be able to respond. What's that got to do with creativity? We'll hark back a little bit more too. I'm going to tell you about two ad men who had two very different approaches. Now this gentleman here is a man called Ross Reeves. He was the inventor of something called the Unique Selling Proposition, or USP which you may have come across. The USP is that one thing that sets your brand or product apart from the competitors. Yeah? Buy this product, you will get this benefit. So an example of one of his key USPs is something that M&Ms used for decades. It's the idea that M&Ms melt in your mouth, not in your hand. Okay, so they're chocolate, but because of the candy coating, it's not going to melt and make a mess in your hand. Granted, you probably get colour all over your hand. 
Um, but that that was used, as I say, for decades. So that was something that set M&Ms apart from other chocolate candies. Yeah. Now, Rossa believed that an ad's job is to sell. And you don't muck around. You don't lead people into it. You just get straight to the point. And he advised clients to be wary of brand image ads because they didn't sell. Right? They were about awareness and he thought they were a waste of time. But in the 1960s, his technique, which had been hugely successful, it began to fail. At which point this gentleman's ideas started to soar. It was Bill Burback. We love Bill. Okay? Bill is the man behind the V-Dub ads. Bill's gift was looking at the way things were done and tipping that on its head. So, for example, with the, um, the V-Dub ads, he, he would have this big two-thirds of the page um, was a, an image and the bottom third was copy. Very clean, very clear, easily identifiable. And that was competing with ads that were just all about a picture of the car and, and all these wonderful sort of features and all this and that and the other. Um, and all those ads looked the same, so his really stood out. He believed that ads had to be entertaining for people to pay attention to them. And if they were entertaining, the audience felt like they were being rewarded for spending time engaging with them. So he said he thought the most he thinks the most important thing in advertising is to be original and fresh, which is really difficult. Yeah? Because you can have all the right things in an ad, but as he rightly says, if nobody's made to stop and listen, if you don't catch their attention, then you've wasted that opportunity. They're not going to see it. Yeah? So whose view is right? Is there a case for advertising creativity? There is, if there is a link between advertising effectiveness and advertising creativity. Do you think there is? There is. Okay. So there have been some major research studies, and these studies have proved that more creative advertising is more effective, more creative agencies are more effective, and more creative businesses are more successful, which is fantastic news for us. Okay, now we do know that awards can be controversial, and this is harking back a long, long time now. Good old Kanye, he's going to let her finish. Yeah, right. But yeah, they're controversial. And even in the advertising world, they're controversial. And this guy, this guy called Don Gunn, Donald Gunn, um, he was working at one of the world's most creatively awarded agencies, and he was quite used to people coming up to him and saying, you guys have the most ridiculous awards, it's crazy, you're just patting yourselves on the back, um, why do you even bother, it's really wanky, right? Your awards mean nothing when it comes to actually selling products. And he decided that he didn't necessarily agree, but he was going to set out to find out who was right. Yeah. So what he did was he looked at the previous three years and he identified the 400 most awarded campaigns and commercials and he gathered their case histories. Now this is 1996. Email was pretty scarcely used so this meant that he phoned, wrote to, faxed 129 agencies around the world and said hey I want to find some stuff out can you help me? And 86.5 of them, he got, he got um, information from those 129 agencies. 86.5 of those campaigns that had won awards for creativity had also been associated with marketplace success, right? 336 out of 400, so more than three quarters, had met or exceeded the objectives that the client set. Sounds good, right? 
that's that's not all. So we know that creative ads sell stuff. Yeah. Another guy came along, a guy called Peter Field, and he'd heard about Donald Gunn's work. He at the time was working in the UK for the Institute of Practitioners in advertising. Yep. And he was working a lot with effectiveness data to help agencies figure out what worked and what didn't work, basically. So he heard about Donald's work and he said, hey, can I compare your information with mine? And Donald went, yeah, absolutely, here you go, good luck. And this is what he found. The most creative agencies are more than twice as effective as other agencies. Okay. And I know this is going back a wee way, but this is still relevant. Okay. So the most creative agencies from 2006 to 2010, hugely effective, right? 2010 to 2014, right? These agencies, the super creative agencies, so they had appeared in the gun report um, three times or more, were found to have won 2.2 times as many awards or as much recognition at the Effectiveness Awards than less creative agencies. So we know that creativity is effective. He delved a little bit further into it, okay, and we're talking about market share. So the brands that had creative ads actually gained market share, right? Found that creatively awarded campaigns delivered 11 times the return on investment of non-creatively awarded campaigns. And the client cares about return on investment, right? And as campaigns get more creative, they get more effective. And over time, they become more effective, right? The difference is getting bigger. Great news for us. Here's the kicker. That creativity and that effectiveness translates into business success. And if you're the brand manager, you're the general manager of a, a company and you want to advertise, this is important. At the Cannes um, Awards, every year, there is an award for Creative Marketer of the Year. And it goes to a business that works with a, an advertising agency. So these are the brands you know, right? And every year, one of these companies is given this particular award. What they found looking at though the performance of those businesses on the stock market was that every year that a business has won that particular award, their share performance has gone through the roof. Okay, they've taken a risk on something creative and it's literally paid off. Okay, so there is a link between creative culture and commercial performance. Again, great news for us. Here's why that massive leap happens. And it's this. If a business has an amazing ad, people start talking. It's on their radar. People will remember the ad and they're more likely to think about purchasing that brand the next time they need to. Right? Okay. That's the key thing. These days, we would look at fame. Um, we measure that by whether or not a campaign goes viral. You cannot write a viral campaign. You cannot predict a viral campaign. A whole lot of things have to happen in the universe at the same time for a campaign to go viral. So the most effective campaigns of all are the fame campaigns or the campaigns that go viral. And the beautiful thing about a campaign that goes viral is number one, it's efficient. Number two, it's effective for the brand. But number three, it costs less. And the reason it costs less is people will spread it for you. Yeah. 
And we've all done it. We've seen something we love and we share it. And it kind of gets traction and goes and goes and goes. And you've shared it with your group of friends and one of them might share it with someone, you know, another group that they know. And it goes on. And that business has not paid for that. They've not had to buy a billboard. They've not had to pay for um, airtime on TV or a, in a cinema, anywhere like that. You've spread it for them. So it's getting much bigger reach for much less cost. Gotta love that. So aim to write ads that will go viral. It is, um, as I say, easier said than done. But when it happens, it happens. Remind me to talk to you about the, um, the Samsung campaign <clears throat> that DDB did. Anyway, you can read more about all of this in the case for creativity. Um, there's a great book that is in the AUT library and it's written by a Kiwi. Um, and he was the world's number one planning director. And he used to work at Auckland's Calenzo BBDO. He's got his own business now as a consultant, as you would. Grab hold of that if you're interested in finding out more. Um, I also have a selection of some really great creative, effective ads that won Khan's Lions Awards. I'm not going to play for them for you in this video, but if you go to the slides and go through to them, you can view the ad and then the slide immediately afterwards talks about the results and how effective and see if you can figure out why they got the traction that they did. Um, we're going to touch on some creativity in class this week. You're going to be doing some, some things that will help you to unlock that side of you that will come in handy down the line, particularly with the next part of your assignment for Penguin. So please bring pen and paper along with you. And we really look forward to seeing you there. Until then... Watch some ads.